In classical mechanics, Newton's theorem of revolving orbits identifies the type of central force needed to multiply the angular speed of a particle by a factor k without affecting its radial motion figures 1 and 2. Newton applied his theorem to understanding the overall rotation of orbits apsidal precession, figure 3 that is observed for the Moon and planets. The term, radial motion, signifies the motion towards or away from the center of force, whereas the angular motion is perpendicular to the radial motion. Isaac Newton derived this theorem in Propositions 43–45 of Book 1 of his Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, first published in 1687. In Proposition 43, he showed that the added force must be a central force, one whose magnitude depends only upon the distance r between the particle and a point fixed in space the center. In Proposition 44, he derived a formula for the force, showing that it was an inverse cube force, one that varies as the inverse cube of r. In Proposition 45 Newton extended his theorem to arbitrary central forces by assuming that the particle moved in nearly circular orbit. As noted by astrophysicist Subramanian Chandrasekhar in his 1995 commentary on Newton's Principia, this theorem remained largely unknown and undeveloped for over three centuries. Since 1997, the theorem has been studied by Donald Lyndon Bell and collaborators. Its first exact extension came in 2000 with the work of Muhammad and Vorda. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Historical context. The motion of astronomical bodies has been studied systematically for thousands of years. The stars were observed to rotate uniformly, always maintaining the same relative positions to one another. However, other bodies were observed to wander against the background of the fixed stars. Most such bodies were called planets after the Greek word planetoi, planetoi for wanderers. Although they generally move in the same direction along a path across the sky the ecliptic, individual planets sometimes reverse their direction briefly, exhibiting retrograde motion. To describe this forward and backward motion, Apollonius of Perga c. 262 c. 190 BC developed the concept of deference and epicycles, according to which the planets are carried on rotating circles that are themselves carried on other rotating circles, and so on. Any orbit can be described with a sufficient number of judiciously chosen epicycles, since this approach corresponds to a modern Fourier transform. Roughly 350 years later, Claudius Ptolemaeus published his Almagest, in which he developed this system to match the best astronomical observations of his era. To explain the epicycles, Ptolemy adopted the geocentric cosmology of Aristotle, according to which planets were confined to concentric rotating spheres. This model of the universe was authoritative for nearly 1,500 years. The modern understanding of planetary motion arose from the combined efforts of astronomer Tycho Brahe and physicist Johannes Kepler in the 16th century. Tycho is credited with extremely accurate measurements of planetary motions, from which Kepler was able to derive his laws of planetary motion. According to these laws, planets move on ellipses not epicycles about the Sun not the Earth. Kepler's second and third laws make specific quantitative predictions, planets sweep out equal areas in equal time, and the square of their orbital periods equals a fixed constant times the cube of their semi-major axis. Subsequent observations of the planetary orbits showed that the long axis of the ellipse the so-called line of apsides rotates gradually with time, this rotation is known as apsidal precession. The apses of an orbit are the points at which the orbiting body is closest or furthest away from the attracting center. For planets orbiting the Sun, the apses correspond to the perihelion closest and aphelion furthest. With the publication of his Principia roughly 80 years later, 1687, Isaac Newton provided a physical theory that accounted for all three of Kepler's laws, a theory based on Newton's laws of motion and his law of universal gravitation. In particular, Newton proposed that the gravitational force between any two bodies was a central force F R that varied as the inverse square of the distance R between them. Arguing from his laws of motion, Newton showed that the orbit of any particle acted upon by one such force is always a conic section, specifically an ellipse if it does not go to infinity. However, this conclusion holds only when two bodies are present the two-body problem, the motion of three bodies or more acting under their mutual gravitation the n-body problem remained unsolved for centuries after Newton, although solutions to a few special cases were discovered. 
Newton proposed that the orbits of planets about the Sun are largely elliptical because the Sun's gravitation is dominant. To first approximation, the presence of the other planets can be ignored. By analogy, the elliptical orbit of the Moon about the Earth was dominated by the Earth's gravity. To first approximation, the Sun's gravity and those of other bodies of the Solar System can be neglected. However, Newton stated that the gradual apsidal precession of the planetary and lunar orbits was due to the effects of these neglected interactions. In particular, he stated that the precession of the Moon's orbit was due to the perturbing effects of gravitational interactions with the Sun. Newton's theorem of revolving orbits was his first attempt to understand apsidal precession quantitatively. According to this theorem, the addition of a particular type of central force the inverse cube force can produce a rotating orbit, the angular speed is multiplied by a factor k, whereas the radial motion is left unchanged. However, this theorem is restricted to a specific type of force that may not be relevant. Several perturbing inverse square interactions, such as those of other planets, seem unlikely to sum exactly to an inverse cube force. To make his theorem applicable to other types of forces, Newton found the best approximation of an arbitrary central force F R to an inverse cube potential in the limit of nearly circular orbits, that is, elliptical orbits of low eccentricity, as is indeed true for most orbits in the solar system. To find this approximation, Newton developed an infinite series that can be viewed as the forerunner of the Taylor expansion. This approximation allowed Newton to estimate the rate of precession for arbitrary central forces. Newton applied this approximation to test models of the force causing the apsidal precession of the Moon's orbit. However, the problem of the Moon's motion is dauntingly complex, and Newton never published an accurate gravitational model of the Moon's apsidal precession. After a more accurate model by Clairaut in 1747, analytical models of the Moon's motion were developed in the late 19th century by Hill, Brown, and Delaunay. However, Newton's theorem is more general than merely explaining apsidal precession. It describes the effects of adding an inverse cube force to any central force F R, not only to inverse square forces such as Newton's law of universal gravitation and Coulomb's law. Newton's theorem simplifies orbital problems in classical mechanics by eliminating inverse cube forces from consideration. The radial and angular motions r t and theta 1 t can be calculated without the inverse cube force. Afterwards, its effect can be calculated by multiplying the angular speed of the particle. Omega two equals D theta two D T equals K D theta one D T equals K Omega one Display style omega underscore two equals frac d theta underscore two d t equals k frac d theta underscore one d t equals k omega underscore one. Topic: Mathematical statement. Consider a particle moving under an arbitrary central force F1 R, whose magnitude depends only on the distance R between the particle and a fixed center. Since the motion of a particle under a central force always lies in a plane, the position of the particle can be described by polar coordinates R, theta 1, the radius and angle of the particle relative to the center of force figure 1. Both of these coordinates, R t and theta 1 t, change with time t as the particle moves. Imagine a second particle with the same mass m and with the same radial motion r t, but one whose angular speed is k times faster than that of the first particle. In other words, the azimuthal angles of the two particles are related by the equation θ2 t equals k θ1 t. Newton showed that the motion of the second particle can be produced by adding an inverse cube central force to whatever force f1 r acts on the first particle f2 r minus f 1 r equals l 1 2 m r 3 1 minus k 2 Display style f underscore two r f underscore one r equals frac l underscore one carrot two mister carrot three left one k carrot two right. 
where L1 is the magnitude of the first particle's angular momentum, which is a constant of motion conserved for central forces. If K2 is greater than 1, F2 minus F1 is a negative number, thus, the added inverse cube force is attractive, as observed in the green planet of figures 1 to 4 and 9. By contrast, if K2 is less than 1, F2 minus F1 is a positive number, the added inverse cube force is repulsive, as observed in the green planet of figures 5 and 10, and in the red planet of figures 4 and 5. Alteration of the particle path The addition of such an inverse cube force also changes the path followed by the particle. The path of the particle ignores the time dependencies of the radial and angular motions, such as r t and θ1 t, rather, it relates the radius and angle variables to one another. For this purpose, the angle variable is unrestricted and can increase indefinitely as the particle revolves around the central point multiple times. For example, if the particle revolves twice about the central point and returns to its starting position, its final angle is not the same as its initial angle, rather, it has increased by 2 times 360 degrees equals 720 degrees. Formally, the angle variable is defined as the integral of the angular speed theta 1 Omega one T D T Display style theta underscore one equivalent int omega underscore one T D T A similar definition holds for theta two, the angle of the second particle. If the path of the first particle is described in the form R topic G theta one. The path of the second particle is given by the function r. G theta two k. Since theta two equals k theta one. For example, let the path of the first particle be an ellipse. One r equals a plus b cos theta one. Display style frac one r equals a plus b cos theta underscore one, where a and b are constants. Then the path of the second particle is given by one r equals a plus b cos theta two k. Display style frac one r equals a plus b cos left frac theta underscore two k right. Topic: Orbital precession. If k is close but not equal to one, the second orbit resembles the first but revolves gradually about the center of force. This is known as orbital precession. Figure three. If k is greater than 1, the orbit precesses in the same direction as the orbit figure 3, if k is less than 1, the orbit precesses in the opposite direction. Although the orbit in figure the third of may seem to rotate uniformly, i.e., at a constant angular speed, this is true only for circular orbits. If the orbit rotates at an angular speed omega, the angular speed of the second particle is faster or slower than that of the first particle by omega. In other words, the angular speeds would satisfy the equation omega 2. Topic: <laughs> Omega 1 plus omega. However, Newton's theorem of revolving orbits states that the angular speeds are related by multiplication omega 2. K omega 1, where k is a constant. Combining these two equations shows that the angular speed of the precession equals omega equals k minus 1 omega 1. Hence, omega is constant only if omega 1 is constant. According to the conservation of angular momentum, omega 1 changes with the radius r omega 1 equals L 1 m r 2 Display style omega underscore one equals frac l underscore one mr carrot two, where m and l one are the first particles' mass and angular momentum, respectively, both of which are constant. Hence, omega one is constant only if the radius r is constant, i.e., when the orbit is a circle. 
However, in that case, the orbit does not change as it processes. Topic: <laughs> Illustrative example, Coates's spirals. The simplest illustration of Newton's theorem occurs when there is no initial force, i.e., F1 R equals zero. In this case, the first particle is stationary or travels in a straight line. If it travels in a straight line that does not pass through the origin blue line in figure six, the equation for such a line may be written in the polar coordinates R theta one as one R equals one B cos theta 1 minus theta 0 display style frac 1 r equals frac 1 b cos theta underscore 1 theta underscore 0 where theta 0 is the angle at which the distance is minimized figure 6 the distance r begins at infinity when theta 1 theta 0 topic Minus 90 degrees and decreases gradually until theta 1 theta 0. 0 degrees when the distance reaches a minimum, then gradually increases again to infinity at theta 1 theta 0 equals 90 degrees. The minimum distance b is the impact parameter, which is defined as the length of the perpendicular from the fixed center to the line of motion. The same radial motion is possible when an inverse cube central force is added. An inverse cube central force F2 R has the form F2 R equals mu R3 display style F underscore 2 R equals frac mu R caret 3 where the numerator mu may be positive repulsive or negative attractive. If such an inverse cube force is introduced, Newton's theorem says that the corresponding solutions have a shape called Coates's spirals. These are curves defined by the equation 1r equals 1b cos theta 2 minus theta 0k display style frac 1r equals frac 1b cos left frac theta underscore 2 theta underscore 0k right, where the constant k equals k2 equals 1 minus m mu l 1 2 display style k caret 2 equals 1 frac m mu l underscore 1 caret 2. When the right hand side of the equation is a positive real number, the solution corresponds to an epispiral. When the argument theta 1 theta 0 equals plus or minus 90 degrees times k, the cosine goes to 0 and the radius goes to infinity. Thus, when k is less than 1, the range of allowed angles becomes small and the force is repulsive red curve on right in figure 7. On the other hand, when k is greater than 1, the range of allowed angles increases, corresponding to an attractive force green, cyan and blue curves on left in figure 7, the orbit of the particle can even wrap around the center several times. The possible values of the parameter k may range from 0 to infinity, which corresponds to values of mu ranging from negative infinity up to the positive upper limit, L12 per meter. Thus, for all attractive inverse cube forces negative mu, there is a corresponding epispiral orbit, as for some repulsive ones mu. One of the other solution types is given in terms of the hyperbolic cosine 1 r equals 1 b cos theta 0 minus theta 2 lambda Display style frac one R equals frac one B cosh left frac theta underscore zero theta underscore two lambda right where the constant lambda satisfies lambda two equals M mu L one two minus one Display style lambda carrot two equals frac m mu l underscore one carrot two minus one. This form of Coates's spirals corresponds to one of the two Poinsot spirals, figure eight. The possible values of lambda range from zero to infinity, which corresponds to values of mu greater than the positive number l twelve per meter. Thus, Poinsot spiral motion only occurs for repulsive inverse cube central forces, and applies in the case that l is not too large for the given mu. 
Taking the limit of k or lambda going to zero yields the third form of a Coates's spiral, the so-called reciprocal spiral or hyperbolic spiral, as a solution. One r equals theta two plus epsilon. Display style frac one r equals a theta underscore two plus ver epsilon, where a and epsilon are arbitrary constants. Such curves result when the strength mu of the repulsive force exactly balances the angular momentum mass term mu equals l 1 2 m display style mu equals frac l underscore 1 caret 2 m topic closed orbits and inverse cube central forces Two types of central forces those that increase linearly with distance, f. CR, such as Hooke's law, and inverse square forces, f. CR2, such as Newton's law of universal gravitation and Coulomb's law have a very unusual property. A particle moving under either type of force always returns to its starting place with its initial velocity, provided that it lacks sufficient energy to move out to infinity. In other words, the path of a bound particle is always closed and its motion repeats indefinitely, no matter what its initial position or velocity. As shown by Bertrand's theorem, this property is not true for other types of forces. In general, a particle will not return to its starting point with the same velocity. However, Newton's theorem shows that an inverse cubic force may be applied to a particle moving under a linear or inverse square force such that its orbit remains closed, provided that k equals a rational number. A number is called rational if it can be written as a fraction m, n, where m and n are integers. In such cases, the addition of the inverse cubic force causes the particle to complete m rotations about the center of force in the same time that the original particle completes n rotations. This method for producing closed orbits does not violate Bertrand's theorem, because the added inverse cubic force depends on the initial velocity of the particle. Harmonic and subharmonic orbits are special types of such closed orbits. A closed trajectory is called a harmonic orbit if k is an integer, i.e. if n 1 in the formula k M n, for example, if k equals three, green planet in figures one and four, green orbit in figure nine, the resulting orbit is the third harmonic of the original orbit. Conversely, the closed trajectory is called a subharmonic orbit if k is the inverse of an integer, i.e., if m equals one in the formula k. Topic m n, for example, if k. One third green planet in figure five, green orbit in figure ten. The resulting orbit is called the third subharmonic of the original orbit. Although such orbits are unlikely to occur in nature, they are helpful for illustrating Newton's theorem. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Limit of nearly circular orbits. In Proposition 45 of his Principia, Newton applies his theorem of revolving orbits to develop a method for finding the force laws that govern the motions of planets. Johannes Kepler had noted that the orbits of most planets and the Moon seem to be ellipses, and the long axis of those ellipses can be determined accurately from astronomical measurements. The long axis is defined as the line connecting the positions of minimum and maximum distances to the central point, i.e., the line connecting the two apses. For illustration, the long axis of the planet Mercury is defined as the line through its successive positions of perihelion and aphelion. Over time, the long axis of most orbiting bodies rotates gradually, generally no more than a few degrees per complete revolution, because of gravitational perturbations from other bodies, oblateness in the attracting body, general relativistic effects, and other effects. Newton's method uses this apsidal precession as a sensitive probe of the type of force being applied to the planets. Newton's theorem describes only the effects of adding an inverse cube central force. 
However, Newton extends his theorem to an arbitrary central forces F R by restricting his attention to orbits that are nearly circular, such as ellipses with low orbital eccentricity epsilon 0 .1, which is true of seven of the eight planetary orbits in the Solar System. Newton also applied his theorem to the planet Mercury, which has an eccentricity epsilon of roughly 0.21, and suggested that it may pertain to Halley's comet, whose orbit has an eccentricity of roughly 0.97. A qualitative justification for this extrapolation of his method has been suggested by Valeri, Wilson, and Harper. According to their argument, Newton considered the apsidal precession angle alpha, the angle between the vectors of successive minimum and maximum distance from the center, to be a smooth continuous function of the orbital eccentricity epsilon. For the inverse square force, alpha equals 180 degrees, the vectors to the positions of minimum and maximum distances lie on the same line. If alpha is initially not 180 degrees at low epsilon quasi-circular orbits, then, in general, alpha will equal 180 degrees only for isolated values of epsilon, a randomly chosen value of epsilon would be very unlikely to give alpha equals 180 degrees. Therefore, the observed slow rotation of the apsides of planetary orbits suggests that the force of gravity is an inverse square law. Topic: Quantitative formula equals. To simplify the equations, Newton writes f r in terms of a new function c r. F r equals c r r r three. Display style f r equals frac c r r r caret three where r is the average radius of the nearly circular orbit. Newton expands c r in a series, now known as a Taylor expansion, in powers of the distance r, one of the first appearances of such a series. By equating the resulting inverse cube force term with the inverse cube force for revolving orbits, Newton derives an equivalent angular scaling factor k for nearly circular orbits. 1 k 2 equals r C D C D R R equals R display style frac one k carrot two equals left frac R C right left frac D C doctor right underscore R equals R in other words, the application of an arbitrary central force F R to a nearly circular elliptical orbit can accelerate the angular motion by the factor k without affecting the radial motion significantly. If an elliptical orbit is stationary, the particle rotates about the center of force by 180 degrees as it moves from one end of the long axis to the other the two apses. Thus, the corresponding apsidal angle alpha for a general central force equals k times 180 degrees, using the general law theta 2 equals k theta 1 equals topic examples topic. Newton illustrates his formula with three examples. In the first two, the central force is a power law, F R R n minus three, and hence C R is proportional to R n. The formula above indicates that the angular motion is multiplied by a factor k equals one square root n, so that the apsidal angle alpha equals 180 degrees square root n. This angular scaling can be seen in the apsidal precession, i.e., in the gradual rotation of the long axis of the ellipse figure three. As noted above, the orbit as a whole rotates with a mean angular speed ω equals k-1 omega, where ω equals the mean angular speed of the particle about the stationary ellipse. If the particle requires a time t to move from one apse to the other, this implies that, in the same time, the long axis will rotate by an angle β. Topic Omega T K minus one Omega T equals K minus one times one hundred and eighty degrees. 
For an inverse square law such as Newton's law of universal gravitation, where n equals 1, there is no angular scaling k equals 1, the apsidal angle alpha is 180 degrees, and the elliptical orbit is stationary omega. Topic beta zero. As a final illustration, Newton considers a sum of two power laws. C R A R M plus B R N. Display style C R prop to R caret M plus B R caret N which multiplies the angular speed by a factor k equals a plus b a m plus b n display style k equals sqrt frac a plus b m plus b n Newton applies both of these formulae the power law and sum of two power laws to examine the apsidal precession of the moon's orbit Topic: Precession of the Moon's orbit. The motion of the Moon can be measured accurately and is noticeably more complex than that of the planets. The ancient Greek astronomers Hipparchus and Ptolemy had noted several periodic variations in the Moon's orbit, such as small oscillations in its orbital eccentricity and the inclination of its orbit to the plane of the ecliptic. These oscillations generally occur on a once-monthly or twice-monthly time scale. The line of its apses processes gradually with a period of roughly 8.85 years, while its line of nodes turns a full circle in roughly double that time, 18.6 years. This accounts for the roughly 18-year periodicity of eclipses, the so-called Seiros cycle. However, both lines experience small fluctuations in their motion, again on the monthly time scale. In 1673, Jeremiah Horrocks published a reasonably accurate model of the Moon's motion in which the Moon was assumed to follow a processing elliptical orbit. A sufficiently accurate and simple method for predicting the Moon's motion would have solved the navigational problem of determining a ship's longitude. In Newton's time, the goal was to predict the Moon's position to 2 feet 2 out minutes, which would correspond to a 1 degree error in terrestrial longitude. Horrocks model predicted the lunar position with errors no more than 10 arc minutes. For comparison, the diameter of the Moon is roughly 30 arc minutes. Newton used his theorem of revolving orbits in two ways to account for the apsidal precession of the Moon. First, he showed that the Moon's observed apsidal precession could be accounted for by changing the force law of gravity from an inverse square law to a power law in which the exponent was 2 plus 4 240 thirds, roughly 2.0165. F R equals minus G M M R two plus four two hundred and forty three display style F R equals frac G M M R carrot two plus four two hundred and forty thirds in 1894, Asif Hall adopted this approach of modifying the exponent in the inverse square law slightly to explain an anomalous orbital precession of the planet Mercury, which had been observed in 1859 by Urbain Le Verrier. Ironically, Hall's theory was ruled out by careful astronomical observations of the Moon. The currently accepted explanation for this precession involves the theory of general relativity, which to first approximation adds an inverse quartic force, i.e., one that varies as the inverse fourth power of distance. As a second approach to explaining the Moon's precession, Newton suggested that the perturbing influence of the Sun on the Moon's motion might be approximately equivalent to an additional linear force F R equals A R Two plus B R display style F R equals frac A R caret two plus B R. The first term corresponds to the gravitational attraction between the Moon and the Earth, where R is the Moon's distance from the Earth. The second term, Sir Newton reasoned, might represent the average perturbing force of the Sun's gravity of the Earth-Moon system. Such a force law could also result if the Earth were surrounded by a spherical dust cloud of uniform density. 
Using the formula for K for nearly circular orbits, and estimates of A and B, Newton showed that this force law could not account for the Moon's precession, since the predicted apsidal angle alpha was approximately equals 180.76 degrees rather than the observed alpha approximately equals 181.525 degrees. For every revolution, the long axis would rotate 1.5 degrees, roughly half of the observed 3.0 degrees. Topic. Generalization Isaac Newton first published his theorem in 1687, as Propositions 43–45 of Book I of his Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. However, as astrophysicist Subramanian Chandrasekhar noted in his 1995 commentary on Newton's Principia, the theorem remained largely unknown and undeveloped for over three centuries. The first generalization of Newton's theorem was discovered by Muhammad and Vorda in 2000. As Newton did, they assumed that the angular motion of the second particle was k times faster than that of the first particle, θ2. K theta 1. In contrast to Newton, however, Muhammad and Vorda did not require that the radial motion of the two particles be the same, R1. R2. Rather, they required that the inverse radii be related by a linear equation 1 R 2 T equals A R 1 T plus B display style frac one R underscore two T equals frac A R underscore one T plus B. This transformation of the variables changes the path of the particle. If the path of the first particle is written R one equals G theta one, the second particle's path can be written as A R two one minus B R two equals G theta two K display style frac R underscore two one B R underscore two equals G left frac theta underscore two K right if the motion of the first particle is produced by a central force F1 R, Muhammad and Vorda showed that the motion of the second particle can be produced by the following force F 2 r 2 equals 3 1 minus b r 2 2 f 1 a r 2 1 minus b r 2 plus l 2 m r 3 1 minus k 2 minus b l 2 m r 2 Display style f underscore two r underscore two equals frac a carrot three left one b r underscore two right carrot two f underscore one left frac r underscore two one b r underscore two right plus frac l carrot two mr carrot three left one k carrot two right frac b l carrot two mr carrot two According to this equation, the second force F2 R is obtained by scaling the first force and changing its argument, as well as by adding inverse square and inverse cube central forces. For comparison, Newton's theorem of revolving orbits corresponds to the case of topic 1 and b 0, so that R1 Topic R2. In this case, the original force is not scaled, and its argument is unchanged. The inverse cube force is added, but the inverse square term is not. Also, the path of the second particle is R2. G theta 2 k consistent with the formula given above.
Topic: Derivations. Topic: Newton's derivation. Newton's derivation is found in section IX of his Principia, specifically propositions 43 to 45. His derivations of these propositions are based largely on geometry. Proposition 43, Problem 30 It is required to make a body move in a curve that revolves about the center of force in the same manner as another body in the same curve at rest. Newton's derivation of Proposition 43 depends on his Proposition 2, derived earlier in the Principia. Proposition 2 provides a geometrical test for whether the net force acting on a point mass a particle is a central force. Newton showed that a force is central if and only if the particle sweeps out equal areas in equal times as measured from the center. Newton's derivation begins with a particle moving under an arbitrary central force F1 R. The motion of this particle under this force is described by its radius R T from the center as a function of time, and also its angle θ1 T. In an infinitesimal time dt, the particle sweeps out an approximate right triangle whose area is d a 1 equals 1 2 r 2 d theta 1 Display style dar underscore 1 equals frac 1 2 r caret 2 d theta underscore 1 since the force acting on the particle is assumed to be a central force, the particle sweeps out equal angles in equal times, by Newton's proposition 2. Expressed another way, the rate of sweeping out area is constant d a 1 d t equals 1 2 r 2 d theta 1 d t equals c o n s t a n t Display style frac dar underscore one d t equals frac one two r caret two frac d theta underscore one d t equals mathrm constant this constant aerial velocity can be calculated as follows. At the apapsis and periapsis, the positions of closest and furthest distance from the attracting center, the velocity and radius vectors are perpendicular, therefore, the angular momentum L1 per mass m of the particle written as H1 can be related to the rate of sweeping out areas H1 equals L1 m equals R V one equals R two D theta one D T equals two D A one D T Display style h underscore one equals frac l underscore one m equals r v underscore one equals r caret two frac d theta underscore one d t equals two frac dar underscore one d t. Now consider a second particle whose orbit is identical in its radius, but whose angular variation is multiplied by a constant factor k theta two t equals k theta. 1 t display style theta underscore 2 t equals k theta underscore 1 t the aerial velocity of the second particle equals that of the first particle multiplied by the same factor k h 2 equals 2 d a 2 d t equals R two D theta two D T equals K R two D theta one D T equals two K 
d a 1 d t equals k h 1 display style h underscore 2 equals 2 frac dar underscore 2 dt equals r caret 2 frac d theta underscore 2 dt equals kr caret 2 frac d theta underscore 1 dt equals 2k frac dar underscore 1 dt equals kh underscore 1 since k is a constant the second particle also sweeps out equal areas in equal times Therefore, by proposition 2, the second particle is also acted upon by a central force F2 R. This is the conclusion of proposition 43. Proposition 44 The difference of the forces, by which two bodies may be made to move equally, one in a fixed, the other in the same orbit revolving, varies inversely as the cube of their common altitudes, to find the magnitude of F2 R from the original central force F1 R, Newton calculated their difference F2 R minus F1 R using geometry and the definition of centripetal acceleration. In Proposition 44 of his Principia, he showed that the difference is proportional to the inverse cube of the radius, specifically by the formula given above, which Newton's writes in terms of the two constant aerial velocities, h1 and h2 f 2 r minus f 1 r equals m h 1 2 minus h 2 2 r 3 Display style f underscore two r f underscore one r equals m frac h underscore one carrot two h underscore two carrot two r carrot three Proposition forty five problem thirty one to find the motion of the apsides in orbits approaching very near to circles. In this proposition, Newton derives the consequences of his theorem of revolving orbits in the limit of nearly circular orbits. This approximation is generally valid for planetary orbits and the orbit of the Moon about the Earth. This approximation also allows Newton to consider a great variety of central force laws, not merely inverse square and inverse cube force laws. Modern derivation Modern derivations of Newton's theorem have been published by Whittaker 1937 and Chandrasekhar 1995. By assumption, the second angular speed is k times faster than the first omega 2 equals d theta 2 d t equals K D theta one D T equals K Omega one Display style Omega underscore two equals frac D theta underscore two D T equals K frac D theta underscore one D T equals K Omega underscore one since the two radii have the same behavior with time r t, the conserved angular momenta are related by the same factor k l two equals m r two omega two equals m r two k omega one equals K L one display style L underscore two equals Mr. Carrot two Omega underscore two equals Mr. Carrot two K Omega underscore one equals K L underscore one. The equation of motion for a radius r of a particle of mass m moving in a central potential v r is given by Lagrange's equations m d two r d T two minus M R Omega two equals M D two R D T two minus L two M R three equals 
f r display style m frac d caret 2 r dt caret 2 mr omega caret 2 equals m frac d caret 2 r dt caret 2 frac l caret 2 mr caret 3 equals f r applying the general formula to the two orbits yields the equation m d 2 r d t 2 equals f 1 r plus l 1 2 m r 3 equals f 2 r plus l 2 2 m r 3 equals f 2 r plus k 2 l 1 2 m r 3 Display style m frac d carrot two r d t carrot two equals f underscore one r plus frac l underscore one carrot two mr carrot three equals f underscore two r plus frac l underscore two carrot two mr carrot three equals f underscore two r plus frac k carrot two l underscore one carrot two mr carrot three, which can be rearranged to the form f two r equals f 1 r plus l 1 2 m r 3 1 minus k 2 Display style f underscore two r equals f underscore one r plus frac l underscore one carrot two mr carrot three left one k carrot two right. This equation relating the two radial forces can be understood qualitatively as follows: the difference in angular speeds, or equivalently, in angular momenta, causes a difference in the centripetal force requirement. To offset this, the radial force must be altered with an inverse cube force. Newton's theorem can be expressed equivalently in terms of potential energy, which is defined for central forces F R equals minus D V D R Display style F R equals frac D V doctor. The radial force equation can be written in terms of the two potential energies minus D V two D R equals minus D V one D R plus L one two M R three one minus K two Display style frac dv underscore two doctor equals frac dv underscore one doctor plus frac l underscore one carrot two mr carrot three left one k carrot two right. Integrating with respect to the distance r, Newton's theorem states that a k-fold change in angular speed results from adding an inverse square potential energy to any given potential energy v one r v two r equals V one R plus L one two two M R two one minus K two Display style v underscore two r equals v underscore one r plus frac l underscore one carrot two two mr carrot two left one k carrot two right. Topic: Newton's geometric proof from the Principia. Topic simplified geometric proof of Proposition 44 Although Newton states that the problem was to be solved by Proposition 6, he does not use it explicitly. 
In the following, simplified proof, proposition 6 is used to show how the result is derived. Newton's detailed proof follows that, and finally proposition 6 is appended, as it is not well known. Proposition 44 uses proposition 6 to prove a result about revolving orbits. In the propositions following proposition 6 in section 2 of the Principia, he applies it to specific curves, for example, conic sections. In the case of proposition 44, it is applied to any orbit, under the action of an arbitrary force directed towards a fixed point, to produce a corresponding revolving orbit. In Fig. 1. Mn is part of that orbit. At point P, the body moves to Q under the action of a force directed towards S, as before. The force, F, S P, is defined at each point P on the curve. In Fig. 2, the corresponding part of the revolving orbit is Minnesota with S as its center of force. Assume that initially, the body in the static orbit starts out at right angles to the radius with speed v. The body in the revolving orbit must also start at right angles and assume its speed is v. In the case shown in Fig. 1, v greater than v and the force is directed towards s. The argument applies equally if v let s a be the initial direction of the static orbit, and s a, that of the revolving orbit. If after a certain time the bodies in the respective orbits are at p and p, then the ratio of the angles a s p a s p equals p s q p s q equals v v display style frac asp asp equals frac p s q p s q equals frac v v and similarly the areas a S P A S P equals P S Q P S Q equals V V Display style frac asp asp equals frac PSQ PSQ equals frac V V and the radii S P equals S P display style S P equals S P S Q equals S Q display style square equals square S A equals S A display style S A equals S A the figure pricks and the arc PY in Fig. 2 is the figure PRQT and the arc PQ in Fig. 1, expanded linearly in the horizontal direction in the ratio V, V, so that P U equals P U display style PU equals PU U T equals U X display style U T equals U X and q t equals v q t v display style quart equals frac v quart v the straight lines quart and quart should really be circular arcs with centers s and s and radii square and square respectively in the limit their ratio becomes v v Display style frac v v, whether they are straight lines or arcs. Since in the limit the forces are parallel to S P and S P, if the same force acted on the body in Fig. 2 as in Fig. 1, the body would arrive at y, since ry equals r q. The difference in horizontal speed does not affect the vertical distances. Newton refers to corollary 2 of the laws of motion where the motion of the bodies is resolved into a component in the radial direction acted on by the whole force, and the other component transverse to it, acted on by no force. However, the distance from y to the center, s is now greater than square, so an additional force is required to move the body to q such that square equals square. The extra force is represented by yq, and f is proportional to ry plus yq, just as f is to rq. R Q equals S P minus P U 
minus s t display style r q equals s p pu street a q equals s p minus p u minus s t equals a q plus s t minus s t display style r q equals s p pu street equals r q plus s t street the difference s t minus s t equals y q display style street street equals y q can be found as follows s t 2 equals s q 2 minus q t 2 display style street caret 2 equals square caret 2 quart caret 2 s t 2 equals s q 2 minus q t 2 display style street caret 2 equals square caret 2 quart caret 2 so s t minus s t s t plus s T equals Q T two minus Q T two Display style Saint Street St plus S T equals quart carrot two quart carrot two and in the limit, as quart and quart approach zero, street plus street becomes equal to square plus square or two SP so Y Q Point two S P equals Q T two V two minus V two V two Display style Y Q point two S P equals frac quart carrot two V carrot two V carrot two V carrot two Therefore R Q equals a Q plus S T minus S T equals a Q plus Q T two V two minus V Two two S P V two Display style RQ equals RQ plus ST street equals RQ plus frac quart carrot two V carrot two V carrot two two SP V carrot two Since from proposition six fig point one and see below the force equals K Q R S P two Q T two Display style equals frac K Q R S P carrot two quart carrot two dividing by S P two Q T two K Display style frac S P carrot two quart carrot two K where k is constant to obtain the forces f s p equals f s p plus k v 2 minus v 2 2 s p 3 v 2 
Display style F S P equals F S P plus frac K V carrot two V carrot two two S P carrot three V carrot two in Fig. 3 at the initial point A of the static curve, draw the tangent R, which is perpendicular to SA and the circle AQD which just touches the curve at A. Let ρ be the radius of that circle. Since angle SAR is a right angle, the center of the circle lies on SA. From the property of a circle Q T 2 equals A T 2 rho minus a t equals r q 2 rho minus r q display style quart carrot 2 equals at 2 rho at equals r q 2 rho r q and in the limit as q approaches a this becomes rho equals q t 2 2 r q display style row equals quart carrot 2 2 r q hence f s a equals k 2 rho s a 2 display style f s a equals frac k 2 rho s a carrot 2 and since f s a is given, this determines the constant k. However, Newton wants the force at a to be of the form c v two s a two, where c is a constant, so that f s p equals f s p plus c rho v two minus V two S P three Display style F S P equals F S P plus frac C row V carrot two V carrot two S P carrot three where C equals F S A S A two V two Display style C equals frac F S A S A carrot two V carrot two. The expression for F S P above is the same as Newton's in corollary four of proposition forty four, except that he uses different letters. He writes G F equals V V Display style frac G F equals frac V V where g and f are not necessarily equal to v and v respectively, and uses the letter v for the constant corresponding to c, and the letter x for the function f s p. The above geometric proof shows very clearly where the additional force arises from to make the orbit revolve with respect to the static orbit. <laughs> Newton's proof of Proposition 44 Newton's proof is complicated, in view of the simplicity of the above proof. As an example, his proof requires some deciphering, as the following sentence shows, and therefore, if with center C and any radius CP or CP a circular sector is described equal to the total area VPC which the body P revolving in an immobile orbit has described in any time by a radius drawn to the center, the difference between the forces by which the body P in an immobile orbit and body P in a mobile orbit revolve will be to the centripetal force by which some body, by a radius drawn to the center, would have been able to describe that sector uniformly in the same time in which the area VPC was described as G2F2 to F2. He initially regards the infinitesimal tau display style tau as fixed, then the areas SPQ and SPQ are proportional to V and V, respectively, and therefore Q T S P V tau display style quart SP prop two V tau and Q T S P V Tau Display style quart S P prop two V Tau 
at each of the points p and p and y q equals q t 2 minus q t 2 2 s p 1 s p 3 Display style y q equals frac quart carrot two quart carrot two two s p prop two frac one s p carrot three. So the additional force varies inversely as the cube of the radius. In Fig. One x q is a circular arc with center s and radius square meeting s p at x. The perpendicular x y meets r q at y and y q equals q t. 2 2 s p display style y q equals frac quart carrot 2 2 s p let phi s q display style phi square be the force required to make a body move in a circle of radius square if it has the same speed as the transverse speed of the body in the static orbit at q f S P minus F S P Phi S P equals Y Q Y Q equals Q T two minus Q T two Q T two equals V two minus V two V two Display style frac F S P F S P Phi S P equals frac Y Q Y Q equals frac quart carrot two quart carrot two quart carrot two equals frac V carrot two V carrot two V carrot two at every point P and in particular at the upside A F S A minus F S A Phi S A equals V two minus V two V two Display style frac F S A F S A Phi S A equals frac V carrot two V carrot two V carrot two But at A fig three The ratio of the force that makes the body follow the static curve air to that required to make it follow the circle A B with radius S A is inversely as the ratio of their radii of curvature, since they are both moving at the same speed V perpendicular to S A F S A Phi S A equals S A Rho Display style frac F S A Phi S A equals frac S A Rho From the first part of the proof F S P minus F S P equals F S A minus F S A S A three S P three equals row F S A S A two V two minus V two V two S P three Display style F S P F S P equals frac F S A F S A S A carrot three S P carrot three equals frac row F S A S A carrot two V carrot two V carrot two V carrot two S P carrot three 
substituting Newton's expression for F S A gives the result obtained previously. Topic: <laughs> Newton's proof of proposition 45. To find the motion of the apsides in orbits approaching circles, proposition 44 was devised expressly to prove this proposition. Newton wants to investigate the motion of a body in a nearly circular orbit attracted by a force of the form F S P equals gamma S P N minus 3 display style F S P equals gamma S P caret N3 he approximates the static curve by an ellipse with an inverse square force F S P directed to one of the foci, made to revolve by the addition of an inverse cube force, according to Proposition 44. For the static ellipse, with the force varying inversely as S P squared F S P equals C V 2 S P 2 Display style F S P equals frac C V carrot two S P carrot two. Since C is defined above so that F S A equals C V two S A two. Display style F S A equals frac C V carrot two S A carrot two. With the body in the static orbit starting from the upper apside at A, it will reach the lower apside, the point closest to S, after moving through an angle of 180 degrees. Newton wants a corresponding revolving orbit starting from apside, A, about a point S, with the lower apside shifted by an angle, alpha, where 180 plus alpha 180 equals V V Display style frac 180 plus alpha 180 equals frac v v. The initial speed v at a must be just less than that required to make the body move in a circle. Then rho can be taken as equal to s a or s a. The problem is to determine v from the value of n so that alpha can be found or given alpha to find n. F s p equals F S P plus C Rho V two minus V two S P three equals C S P V two plus S a V two minus V two S P three Display style F S P equals F S P plus frac C row V carrot two V carrot two S P carrot three equals frac C S P V carrot two plus S A V carrot two V carrot two S P carrot three letting S P equals S A minus X display E style S P equals S A X F S P equals C S A V two minus X V two S P three Display style F S P equals frac C Sav carrot two fifteen carrot two S P carrot three Then by our method of converging series F S P equals Gamma S P N S P three equals gamma s a minus 
x n s p 3 equals gamma s a n minus 1 s a minus n x s p 3 Display style f sp equals frac gamma sp carrot n sp carrot three equals frac gamma s a x carrot n sp carrot three equals frac gamma s a carrot n one s a n x sp carrot three plus terms in x two and above which can be ignored because the orbit is almost circular, so x is small compared to s a. Comparing the two expressions for f sp f s p equals gamma s a n minus 1 s a minus n x s p 3 equals c s a v 2 minus x v 2 s p 3 display style f s p equals frac gamma s a caret n 1 s a n x s p caret 3 equals frac c sav caret 2 15 caret 2 s p caret 3 it follows that v v equals 1 n 1 2 equals 180 plus alpha 180 display style frac v v equals frac 1 n caret 1 half equals frac 180 plus alpha 180 also f s p equals c v 2 s p n minus 3 s a n minus 1 display style f s p equals frac c v caret 2 s p caret n 3 s a caret n 1 the ratio of the initial forces at a is given by f s a f s a equals 1 n display style frac f s a f s a equals frac 1 n topic proposition 6 for proof of proposition 44 above In Fig. 1, a body is moving along a specific curve Mn acted on by a centripetal force, towards the fixed point S. The force depends only of the distance of the point from S. The aim of this proposition is to determine how the force varies with the radius, sp. The method applies equally to the case where the force is centrifugal. In a small time, tau, display style tau. The body moves from P to the nearby point Q draw QR parallel to SP meeting the tangent at R, and quart perpendicular to SP meeting it at T. If there was no force present it would have moved along the tangent at P with the speed that it had at P, arriving at the point, R if the force on the body moving from P to Q was constant in magnitude and parallel to the direction SP, the arc PQ would be parabolic with PR as its tangent and QR would be proportional to that constant force and the square of the time. Tau display style tau. Conversely, if instead of arriving at R, the body was deflected to Q, then a constant force parallel to SP with magnitude F Q R tau two display style F prop two frac Q R tau caret two would have caused it to reach Q instead of R. 
however, since the direction of the radius from s to points on the arc PQ and also the magnitude of the force towards s will change along PQ, the above relation will not give the exact force at P if Q is sufficiently close to P, the direction of force will be almost parallel to SP all along PQ and if the force changes little, PQ can be assumed to be approximated by a parabolic arc with the force given as above in terms of QR and tau display style tau the time tau display style tau is proportional to the area of the sector spq this is kepler's second law a proof is demonstrated in proposition 1 book 1 in the principia since the arc PQ can be approximated by a straight line, the area of the sector SPQ and the area of the triangle SPQ can be taken as equal so F Q R tau 2 equals K Q R S P 2 Q T Two display style f prop two frac q r tau caret two equals frac k q r s p caret two quart caret two, where k is constant. Again, this is not exact for finite lengths p q. The force law is obtained if the limit of the above expression exists as a function of s p as p q approaches zero. In fact, in time tau display style tau. The body with no force would have reached a point, W, further from P than R however, in the limit QW becomes parallel to SP. The point W is ignored in Newton's proof. Also, Newton describes QR as the versed sine of the arc with P at its center and length twice QP. Although this is not strictly the same as the QR that he has in the diagram fig.1, in the limit, they become equal. Notes this proposition is based on Galileo's analysis of a body following a parabolic trajectory under the action of a constant acceleration. In Proposition 10, he describes it as Galileo's theorem, and mentions Galileo several other times in relation to it in the Principia. Combining it with Kepler's second law gives the simple and elegant method. In the historically very important case where Mn in Fig. 1 was part of an ellipse and S was one of its foci, Newton showed in Proposition 11 that the limit QR, QT2 was constant at each point on the curve so that the force on the body directed towards the fixed point S varied inversely as the square of the distance SP. Besides the ellipse with the center at the focus, Newton also applied Proposition 6 to the hyperbola Proposition 12, and the parabola Proposition 13. Also, to the ellipse with the center of force at the center of the ellipse proposition 10, to the equiangular spiral proposition 9, and to the circle, with the center of force not coinciding with the center, and even on the circumference proposition 7. See also Kepler problem Laplace Runge lens vector Bertrand's theorem Two-body problem in general relativity Newton's theorem about ovals